One evening this spring, as part of a student-run lecture series, two men vied for the souls of students who packed MIT's Kresge Auditorium. They were Dr. Timothy Leary, founder of the League for Spiritual Discovery, which advocates LSD as a religious sacrament, and MIT professor Jerome Letvin, who thinks of Dr. Leary as an agent of the devil. Timothy Leary began experiments with LSD as a lecturer in psychology at Harvard. Harvard dismissed him in 1963. He is now out on a $30,000 bond for possession of marijuana. Dr. Leary spoke first, mainly in darkness, while psychedelic effects were projected on a screen behind him. We have recreated these effects in color. I am beginning tonight's uh, ceremony by uh, offering this chalice, which I'm drinking, to uh, all of us. The chalice contains a powerful and dangerous chemical given to me by the Boston water supply. <laughs> it's uh, odorless, colorless, tasteless. It's um, addictive. <laughs> As a matter of fact, As a matter of fact, uh, if you get hooked on it and they take it away from you, uh, you crawl on your hands and knees and your tongue gets black and your eyes bulge. It's, uh, it's also a dangerous chemical. You have to know how to use it. Too much of it in the wrong place, like in your lungs, and it'll kill you. Um, ten feet of it coming over your rowboat. <laughs> Maybe we should pass a law against it because it's so dangerous and so addictive. Maybe only scientists should be allowed to play with it. Or maybe we can learn how to teach our kids how to use it, in which case they'll discover that it, water has many uses and indeed has been used for thousands of years, for millions of years, for billions of years, as a way of life. It's also been used for thousands of years as a sacrament. Now you know what a sacrament is. A sacrament uh, is a psychedelic technique. It's something that you use to get high. Get high? Yes, a sacrament is something that gets you high, gets you off the television stage set. Pretty solid here. Amazing how solidly they make these sets these days. Gets you off the fake prop television stage set of MIT, Cambridge, Massachusetts, United States of America, and reminds you that you're not just a college student, you're not just 22 or 23 or 24 years old, you're 2 billion years old. Had you forgotten that? As a matter of fact, water can remind you uh, where you came from. Remember, you spent nine months in a watery medium first nine months this trip on this planet. Remember all that sloshing? Now, could we have the lights out now, please? I opened our ceremony. Could I have all the lights out, please? You're going to see on the screen um, home movies and slide projections of little travels and trips that we take. The slides give you the LSD experience from the inside, and the movies present the observer's view of an LSD trip from the outside. The movies are unedited film that's been shot minute after minute, hour after hour, during LSD sessions. I lit a candle to open our ceremony tonight, again to remind us that um, you know, who we are and where we came from and what it's all about, because that's what you hear in MIT to learn, isn't it? Uh, fire has been used as a sacrament for thousands of years. It reminds us that uh, we're all creatures of the sun, that uh, we all have little fires 
burning inside of us from solar energy. Now fire is dangerous. Fire can kill, fire can burn, destroy. As a matter of fact, the first fellow that invented fire, Prometheus, uh, got in a lot of trouble with the FDA down in Washington, remember? Uh, they said, wait a minute, they're going too fast. Maybe we're not ready for fire. As a matter of fact, that's a question that often occurs to uh, many of us these days. Maybe man isn't ready for powerful chemicals like LSD and the many new ones that are coming. Maybe man's little mind isn't ready at this moment in evolution to deal with too much, too fast in the way of reality. Fire is uh, dangerous. Maybe we should pass a law against it. Maybe we should peck out the livers of everybody that uses it. So they can't let high school and college children have it. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to keep people from burning themselves up and hurting themselves and killing themselves with fire? Well, we got to start training our kids from the time they can listen to us that fire is here, that water is here, that a lot of energies around that are here that aren't going to go away, and they better learn how to use them from the very earliest moments and know what they can do and what they can't do and how they destroy. Because sometimes when I see what fire is doing to the thin layer of topsoil on this planet, I wonder maybe they were right about Prometheus and maybe the human race isn't ready even now to deal with powers like fire. Now, it may seem eccentric to you that I come to an institute of engineering and technology and start talking about sacraments and earth and air and fire and water and ceremonies, uh, but I don't really think it should be that uh, odd. The uniform I'm wearing may be out of date in this particular brief show you have going here, but uh, people have been sitting barefoot as I am sitting now in front of you for thousands of years in front of candlelight, talking about what I'm talking about. Where are we going? What's it all about? What can we do about it? How can we figure it out? How can we tune it back in? Don't you know that the real, real goal of a scientist is to flip out? Don't you know that? Had you forgotten? Oh, you thought that the role of a scientist was to build bigger and bigger stage sets for the television show we got going here. Yeah, uh, we have to have a big road running from the cops and robbers game here to the cowboy and Indian show over there. And you engineers are supposed to build them so that we can go faster and faster and farther and farther from television show to television show. But um, if you take science seriously, and if you take the history of science seriously, you'll realize that every great scientist wasn't in it for the TV show commercial payoff. He was in it to find out what it's all about. What's the nature of energy? What are the many levels of energy? What are the levels of consciousness? How can we map them out? How can we use them? And as he got to know more and more and to penetrate deeper and deeper into the mysteries of energy around us, he began to flip out. He began to flip out. Look at Einstein. E equals MC squared. Come on, you mean that it's, that's all energy? Wow, Einstein did it without LSD. You have been led to believe, most of you, that religion is something that's uh, serious and something that's mildly hypocritical and has really little to do with the basic questions in life, material or the science. Well, uh, the facts of the matter are that religion is supposed to be fun and ecstasy because, uh, you know, it's all a play that we're involved in of energy. And uh, you think that a religious person is one who goes around the long face uh, reciting the Boy Scout oath. Uh, religion starts as science has always started in the pursuit, the quest for the ultimate questions. And it's fun. Science should be fun. Science should be pleasure. Science should be flipping out, uh, going out of your mind, uh, really uh, uh, stunned by the joy of this uh, incredible energy situation. Now, the message I have is an old one. It's the simplest and most classic message that ever been passed on in world history. It's uh, those six words, drop out, turn on, then come back and tune it in. And then uh, drop out again and turn on and tune it back in. It's a rhythm. 
Now, most of us are brain damaged by what Marshall McLuhan would call the um, Gutenberg galaxy, and most of us think that God and the DNA code made this universe in the uh, nature of subject, object, predicates, sentences. There's no level of energy and no process in biology or physics that operates with subject predicate sentences. Turn on, tune in, drop out, period. End the paragraph, turn the page. It's all a rhythm. It's all a beat. Jackie, give us the beat. You turn on, you find it inside, then you have to come back, you can't stay high all the time, and you have to start building a better model, building a better building, building a better temple, building a better poem, building a better language, building a better music. It's always been done that way. But don't get caught, don't get hooked, don't get attracted by the thing you're building because you got to drop out, and it's a cycle. Turn on, tune in, drop out, keep it going, keep it going, because the nervous system operates that way. 100,000 million signals a second, right? I'm sorry, 1,000 million signals a second coming into your nervous system. It's that same beat. You got to keep it flowing, got to keep it flowing. I want to talk for a minute about the term turn on. To turn on, you have to have a key to get in touch with the neurological, sensory, and cellular information that you've got stored in that two billion year old receptacle you call your body. Now, how do you turn on? Well, I'll tell you this. You can't turn on with words. You can't turn on with thinking. You can't think your way off the sticky black molasses chessboard of American education. I'm sorry. And good works won't do it for you either. You can uh, be as virtuous and as good as you want to, but you're not going to turn on and get the key to the mystery that way. In order to turn on, you've got to have what the religious metaphor calls a sacrament. What's a sacrament? A sacrament is something that changes your body, that changes your nervous system. And if a sacrament that you use doesn't affect your body, doesn't bring about this internal change, then uh, it's not a sacrament. It's a television show prop that they've given you to keep you nice and quiet in the corner of the studio. It staggers the imagination to think of the means and the methods that men have used in the past to turn on, to bring about a change in the sensory, neural equipment that we carry around with us. There's hardly any activity, physical, sensory, or even television prop studio activity that men haven't used at one time or another to get high, to go out of their minds, to come to their senses, to take the trip. Flagellation, solitude, Come together in large temples, silence, music, the tampura, the Indian beat, the drums in Africa, sexual abstinence, carefully worked out in systematic routines of tantric sexuality in which you find the divine with a member of the opposite sex, fasting, or the ingestion of sacred foods. Now today, the sacrament is a chemical, or it's a series of chemicals. Now, let's not get upset about LSD. In the first place, uh, there are longer, stronger, more powerful chemicals that have the same effect as LSD that are in circulation right now in the United States. Uh, there'll be many more coming along. I make this flat prediction, this faster the government passes a law against one of these molecules, a new one will come along. Because for thousands of years, Caesar's been trying to stop people from wandering off the stage set of the studio game and getting outside under the stars, getting back inside to uh, figure out what it's all about. So let's not get too upset about LSD because even the era of biochemistry for bringing about the cellular experience is almost over, within your lifetime, you will see the new sacrament or the new key to the internal process developed. And matter of fact, most of you are going to have a terrible time with your kids in about 25 years because you'll be sitting around home smoking marijuana and preparing for your next uh, weekly LSD session like good, tidy, conventional people should. And your kids are going to come and say, Hey, Dad and Mom, down in Greenwich Village, there's a new technique called electronic brain stimulation. And you're going to say, 
no implanting electrodes in my children's heads. And your kids will be growing pigtails. <laughs> and you're going to get upset and say, why don't you use the old tried and true methods of finding out where it's at, like LSD. Now, <laughs> there's much confusion about the scientific status and the scientific uh, evidence about LSD. And I'll say this quite flatly. There's no evidence that I know of, and I read the literature pretty carefully, that can tell us very much about what LSD does to consciousness, or to the nervous system, or to the genetic uh, material. Any time you hear anyone talking to you about LSD and pretending to give you scientific facts, whether they're pro or con LSD, I suggest that you be very skeptical. I don't know whether LSD is good or bad. I don't know the effects of LSD on the nervous system, on the brain, or on the genetic material. It's a gamble. It's a risk. The sacrament is always a risk. The new technique for expanding consciousness is always a risk. Did you really think that it could be guaranteed for you? Hey, wake up. Have you forgotten who you are and where you came from? That the whole thing is an adventure? And that you're from a long line of adventurers who got into leaky boats and leaky crafts and put strange things in their mouths and put strange things in the ground? Not quite knowing what they're doing? Yeah, taking a psychedelic chemical is a risk. Taking LSD is a risk. It's a gamble. It's Russian roulette. But, what isn't? Can you name anything that you breathe or put in your body or let filter uh, through the atmosphere into your uh, nervous system like television waves that aren't an unknown gamble? And of all the Russian roulette games I uh, see around me, including Vietnam and uh, polluted air, I would say that the Russian roulette of LSD is uh, about the uh, best gamble in the house. To show you the difficult nature of the scientific study of LSD, uh, I want to uh, tell you a story of what happened uh, with the scientific study of marijuana in the United States. You know, marijuana has been around a long time. Everyone has their mind made up about marijuana. How, how many of you have ever read a scientific paper in a scientific journal following the uh, customary uh, checks and controls and language of science. How many of you have uh, evidence uh, about marijuana as sound as the evidence that you would expect uh, that you'd have to have to uh, base your opinions on uh, any other aspect of the energy system around us? Uh, as a matter of fact, you know it's impossible in the United States uh, for the last 15 or 20 years to do scientific research on marijuana. Uh, there was a man in Anslinger back in the 30s who got Congress to uh, pass a law saying that marijuana was bad. Now, as Judeo-Christians, we just have to have something that's bad. It has to be communists, or it has to be witches, or it has to be devils, or it has to be possession, or the infidel, or the pagan. But we have to have something that's bad, and then we pass a law against it. <laughs> now, <laughs> the facts of the matter are that uh, there were some studies done uh, on marijuana, mainly, mainly in England, uh, suggesting that marijuana could be useful as a uh, psychiatric cure for depression because it sure makes you feel good. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, for the last 15 years it's been almost impossible to do research in marijuana. If a full-fledged, kosher, bona fide scientist at an institute like this wanted to research on marijuana, he had to apply for a government license. You know what happens if you apply for a government license? Government inspectors come around and say, what do you want to do research uh, on marijuana for? You say, well, I want to find out what marijuana is about. And they say, what do you mean? We know what it's all about. It's written in the law what it's all about. Marijuana is a narcotic, addictive drug, and it causes rape, violence, aggression. Uh, you're not certainly not going to give MIT students in your laboratory marijuana. Uh, because what would the uh, Massachusetts State Legislature think about that, huh? <laughs> it's been impossible to do research on marijuana. Now, I'd like to tell you a little research that I've done on marijuana. And I want to tell you, playing my cards right on the table, that I came into the research biased. I was very much against LSD. I happen to be an Irish-American, and I like to drink. 
um, as a middle class teacher at Harvard or at the University of California, uh, I'd heard about marijuana, but uh, I had no occasion to use it because beatniks used it. And uh, I didn't know any beatniks, and uh, they were people like Allen Ginsberg and Jack Carrick, they were having a lot of fun, perhaps more fun than I was having. But uh, there was no way I could get marijuana to be interested in it. Um, then we got involved up at Harvard uh, doing research on LSD. And I found out to my surprise that enormous numbers of young people were using marijuana, even Harvard students and graduate students. Well, I have to laugh when I read the, about the problems of the dean at Harvard now uh, when the Crimson announces that 70% of the freshman class smoke marijuana <laughs> and uh, the dean has to announce that they'll um, throw people out of Harvard if they use marijuana because seven years ago I was saying exactly the same things to the people in our research project because I didn't think we should study marijuana because uh, my contract with Harvard that we were going to study LSD which was legal in those days amazing you just right away and get it <laughs> um, I didn't think it would be fair to mix marijuana up with LSD in our research, so I would go around, just like the deans at Harvard, around our research projects in Newton or in Mexico, and I'd say, Daddy, don't allow no pot smoking in here. And it wasn't, in fact, until I left Harvard and uh, left institutional commitments that I decided I would do some research on marijuana. But I actually didn't get around to doing it seriously until I went to India, and about the first uh, week I was in India, I went to a uh, place called a ganja shop, licensed in the city of Calcutta, and I bought about four ounces of marijuana for a dime or so. <laughs> and I was with a holy man, a guru named Asok Fakir, and he took me down to the Ganges River, and we sat there with a group of Shivites sitting around the burning ghats, and uh, I really began to learn something about marijuana. And I was in India for five months, and I smoked marijuana uh, every day, uh, trying it out uh, in um, different contexts, in different activities. Now, the interesting thing about marijuana, you see, marijuana, I'm sorry to say, my beloved robots of Menopausal Institute of Technology, <laughs> there's no good and evil in this world. Marijuana is neither good nor bad, LSD is neither good nor bad. As a matter of fact, there's probably no activity that you engage in from day to day, week to week, that wouldn't be helped or hindered by the use of marijuana. And the scientific question is, which ones would be hindered? In which case, you don't ban marijuana, you just don't um, use the energy that way and find out which activities are helped by marijuana and go down to the licensed ganja shore in Cambridge Square and get it. Now, I want to uh, conclude my sermon with some comments about dropping out. This, uh, at the moment, <laughs> tends to be the controversial part of the motto, uh, turn on, tune in, drop out. Everyone nowadays accepts the notion of turning on. Even Madison Avenue is telling you that Salem cigarettes will turn you on. Everyone wants to be tuned in. But drop out. Come on, you can't say drop out. You can't tell college students they should drop out of college. You can't tell middle-aged people who have mortgage pay they should drop out of their jobs. And I'm sorry, I mean, I didn't invent this. I'm just reading the lines that were given to me. You've got to drop out. Now, um, there's a lot said about uh, education. Well, you've got to finish your education. When I hear that said, uh, I uh, shudder and my cells shrink because, and I'm sorry to say this, and I say this with great love and great affection because I'm part of this whole institution the way I'm going, but. The education system at the present time in the United States does neurological damage to the nervous system and functions as a narcotic addictive drug. It rather shocks me to think about how we take our children, at that our children who are born with 13 billion nerve cells, our children who are Buddhas, born the final product, up to date, last minute version of a two billion year old assembly line back in some DNA Detroit, checking the new models, consumer research. Hey, how's the weather up there? Ah, yes, the ice age is going back. All right, take a little more hair off the next model. Yeah. <laughs> what color eyes does she like this millennium? Oh, blue, a little more blue in the next model. We were all born perfect, right up to date models. But what happened at the age of four or five, our parents, uh, with the best intentions, turned us over to a bunch of strangers that they didn't know 
and probably would have even had a dinner at their house to be trained in the only crucial issue of life, control of consciousness. The educational process is a real dangerous drug. Use it carefully because you're likely to get hooked. Now, <clears throat> you, the younger generation in particular, have got to drop out. And by drop out, I mean all the way. You can't vote. I urge you not to politic. Don't pick it. Don't get involved in any of these menopausal mind games because it doesn't make any difference. Remember 1962? We voted for a peace candidate. Ha <laughs> ha. And you think it makes a difference? Now, you face a problem that has never been faced in this particular magnitude in human history. The speed up, the acceleration of technology and knowledge and means of changing things. Your generation has grown up in a society that's a thousand or ten thousand years beyond the society of your grandfathers and even of your parents. And I want to present one scientific hypothesis, and there's plenty of evidence to back it up. One hypothesis which is so shocking and so frightening to our sense of the way it should be <coughs> that I suspect that this finding and its implications have been really repressed in the Freudian sense because it's a staggering set of data. And it's this. After the age of 20 or 25, neurological studies show us that the human nervous system begins to lose cells. That means you have less cells at 30 and at 35 and at 40 and at 45 than you had at 20. You're losing brain cells every year of your life after you leave college. Which means that at my age, 45, I'm partly brain damaged. It means... <laughs> you like that, huh? You knew that anyway. <laughs> Dr. Sidney Cohen in California has made me promise that I'll turn my brain over to neurologists after I die. <laughs> And uh, he's going to do the same for me. Now, what does this mean? It means that you young people cannot buy the system of a menopausal mentality generation. You know the men who are running this world, this country, this state, had their minds made up about 1910 or 1915. You remember rat -ta, 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 ta machine guns in the old World War trenches and prohibition and booze? <laughs> you just can't buy their system. You just can't buy their system. Uh, if you ever get around to uh, running for office, which I hope none of you will, if you ever get around to making laws, I suggest the first law you pass is based upon this uh, neurological fact about brain damage. No one over the age of 50 years old should be allowed to vote or hold power over young seed-carrying people, should they? Does that make neurological sense to yourselves? It doesn't to mine. Now, in the next six months, a year, two years, there's going to be a lot of tension in this country about the control of consciousness because, like it or not, uh, believe it or not, we have entered into a new age. And I would call it uh, the age of consciousness. And the implications of this revolution in consciousness are much greater than uh, the technological uh, or the atomic or the electronic age because this age is focusing inside. And for the first time in human history, at least in Western history, because they knew all this 4,000 years ago in India, for the first time in human Western history, man has finally caught on that it doesn't make as much difference what goes on out there as it does how much control and freedom you have in here. The internal trip can be observed, it can be labeled, it can be manipulated, it can be controlled, and it can be replicated just as easily as any experiment in external science. And um, you've got to uh, turn on your parents. And I can't turn on LBJ, but he's got some young people around. And if they've been to good colleges, uh, the statistics tell us that uh, half of them, which means either she or a roommate, is turned on. So that's the way uh, we've got to do it. We've got to say, Daddy Bird, you've done enough. <laughs> Daddy Bird, it was 30 years ago that you uh, ran for the president of the bank. And you've got steel over the world now, Daddy Bird. And you've done enough. Come on, drop out and turn on and learn how to make love all over again and come to your senses.
I think it's time to stop. Drop out. Thank you. When Dr. Timothy Leary, the high priest of the League for Spiritual Discovery, finished speaking, Dr. Jerome Letvin took the floor. Dr. Letvin was senior psychiatrist at the Mantina State Hospital in Illinois. He is now professor of communications physiology in the departments of biology and electrical engineering at MIT. He also lectures in the humanities department. Dr. Letvin, who has three teenage children, is known at MIT as a man students can talk to. Now, Tim, your argument is exceedingly seductive. And in the main, I must admit that I find the press of middle age and middle class enormously powerful here in Cambridge. Irritating is all hell. The horrid part is that I, too, sit in front of TV sets, feel myself slumping, pay the taxes. But the problem is whether the navel really replaces TV. I mean, you sitting in front of your navel, you sitting in front of your navel strike, strike me as being, in a sense, very little better off in the first Let's put it this way, no surprises are likely to come about. <laughs> and you aren't even beguiled by good commercials. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think that we must take your thesis extremely seriously. And I will not do you the dishonor of either attacking you on scientific grounds because the question, as is very obvious, is not scientific, but moral. Therefore, for this reason, I would like to confine my remarks strictly to the es Turn that damn thing off. I would like to confine my remarks strictly to the eschatological questions involved. By that I mean simply questions of what constitute good and evil. But I feel somehow or another that this man is in the hands of the devil. That is to say, he is in a private hell of a curious and somewhat Sartrean devising. That is, having made his pact with the devil, this is what he asked for and that's what he gets. For I suspect that in making these pacts, very much like monkey's paw pacts, that what we get, we get literally, and what we lose, we lose rather much of. To look at this man sitting there with the smile, this supernal smile, ecstatic smile, I feel sick. I don't feel that I want to trade. I feel sick for him. And I ask, of you, how many would trade? He assures you he is in the utmost ecstasy when you can get to him. Otherwise, he's in that ecstasy. Why would not any of you trade? Let us take another trade that has been offered in the past. You and I lived through the period of lobotomies. You walk into the office, I don't like my mama, they lift your eyelid up, you know, slash, slash, and you go out, it doesn't matter. You see, you have traded for it doesn't matter a hunk of brain tissue. After all, brain tissue, as he tells you, you're losing so much of it, what's a little bit more? <laughs> you know, does it really matter? No. Here, you trade it. How many of you would take a lobotomy, given the guarantee that thereafter you don't care? You come in saying, I don't want to care. Everything is bothering the hell out of me. Everything is bothering the hell out of me. I want to stop caring. I want to be happy. And so he takes, you know, bang, bang. 
Is this a trade you would make? Why not? No. Wait a minute. This is strictly a rhetorical question. <laughs> I'm asking the question of myself, for I found Tim's presentation extremely compelling. Shorn, if you'll excuse me of those adornments. I think you ought to change them. They're not beautiful. They're symmetrical, but not pretty. At any rate, I find Tim's thesis terribly compelling, and for this reason I feel that I have to answer it for myself, you see. You are selling off the noetic functions. You're selling off exactly those functions which have set you aside critically in every possible way. You're abrogating. You're dissolving these. Henceforth, suspended judgment for a while. You take your martini at 5 o'clock. You come home. You don't want to remember what, such, what sort of a damn fool you were during the day. You don't want to, rem to remember, you know, being pushed down by this guy. The compromise you made that was against your grain, you see. All of these things, you've got to forget them. You cop out with the martini. But with the reassurance that when the alcohol wears off, you are possibly back to a state where judgment miraculously has been restored. This is the same, incidentally, with marijuana. And as an aside, Tim, let me agree with you, I can conceive of no more immoral thing than has been done by the government in the wholesale banning of drugs, for I suspect that since the time of Mellon, this is like the Hearst Papers trying to abolish pornography. The more there is of it around, the more they thrive. There's a, fundamentally, there's a fundamentally monstrous thing about forbidding rather than reasoning people out. If you have a thesis, you advance the thesis. There's a counter thesis. One argues. One does not go with force of the kind that the government has done spurring the crime rate as it has been done by the morphine addicts, etc. And I feel very violently about this because I used to take care of an addict ward when I was back in Mentino. <coughs> as I say, I'm perfectly willing to admit with you that the government has done a monstrous thing in forbidding many of the, many of the drugs that are around. The forbidding of marijuana, I believe, is pure nonsense in the light of the LaGuardia report. It is, however, the law of the land, and therefore I cannot advise people in conscience to break the law of the land for the very simple reason that I'm not permitted to. All right? <laughs> but when it comes to LSD, to psilocybin, to all of these other drugs that you have been handing out, that you have been talking about, at this point, sir, I look upon you as a tool of the devil. And I look upon you as a fundamentally vicious tool of the devil. And I will explain to you why. In general, when one takes something like a drink, a martini, or a drink of wine, or gets drunk with one's friends in the evening, and wakes up the next day with a hangover, there is a reassurance, the miraculous reissuance somehow or another of judgment to yourself. Question, with LSD and with psilocybin, with mescaline, do we have this reassurance? You have said, sure, it's Russian roulette. Sure, it's dangerous. But let us look specifically at the danger. And I'm not going to talk neurologically because it would only be gobbledygook. What is the fundamental danger? Let us say that one person out of 50 will have a reaction like this. He will take a dose. He will take a trip. And three days later, he takes a return trip. And a week later, he takes a return trip, not having taken any more drugs. 
How is it possible for anybody on observing this to say to any person, you take one chance in a hundred, the return trips, they're for free. What is a return trip? Let me ask you, if there is no cause, how come the return trip? The flipping in suddenly and the flipping out suddenly. Suddenly the colors whirl about. Suddenly smells have color. Suddenly colors have sounds. And then you're back in the normal world. And what does this smell like? Clinically, Tim, what does this smell like to you? As a clinician, what is this? If you saw a patient who complained of this, what is it that he would have, Tim? Yes. What would you diagnose him as? Visionary mystic. Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> You would diagnose him as a temporal lobe epileptic with an aura. And you know that goddamn well. Where else? He looks this way at me. Those of you who are... Con well... Don't tell me what I know. If you read the description of the aura, either in Penfield and Erickson's book called... Epilepsy and Cerebral Localization, written many years ago. Or if you'll get hold of an exceedingly charming book by McDonald Critchley called The Parietal Lobe, where he discusses also these things. Or if you will simply read Dostoevsky, which is far simpler for most of you, you'll get a notion of what this aura is. And you can become addicted to an aura. When a man comes to me and says, I haven't had a shot, I haven't had any LSD for three months, but I still flip in and flip out. As a clinician, what do I think about? What do I worry about? And what I worry about here, specifically, is that he has a functional lesion. This sounds a joke to you. Functional lesion, because I can't show it by cutting him open but a functional lesion because clinically it goes along with other things that have turned out to be like tumors, like scars, like hits on the head and things of the sort. Very well, this is one thing. Temporal lobe, very weird stuff about the temporal lobe, and I will not go into it. I will simply remark that it is that particular portion of the brain that is affected in half the axe murderers that we have in this country. Has it ever occurred to you, why is it you read about a guy coming home and he knocks off his wife, his three kids, you know, and at the, at the station, he stands there and says, I don't remember. You know, every, aha, uh -huh, you know, real amnesia, you know. <laughs> but let me assure you, half of these things are in fact temporal lobe syndrome, what are called psychomotor seizures. What this fellow had who shot in Texas at the campus, shot the various people, this is roughly the sort of seizure he had. In his case, they found a tumor. What about LSD? What about psilocybin? I know a set of physicists who took a while ago in group because they're curious people. All physicists are curious people. That is, I mean, they're not curious to look at. They are... <laughs> they took in a group of about five or six of them, they took some psilocybin on the recipe gotten from the telephone number here in Cambridge that you're supposed to call to get that recipe. And having taken it, they got violently sick the first day, and every one of them, for three months thereafter, was incapable of doing any theoretical work. On all behavioral counts, the same, but clearly aberrant in their higher critical functions, as Tim said. But with a hangover of this, a hangover that lasts not an hour or two hours, but several days, several months. 
Let us give it only several days. Let's be conservative. A hangover for a few days. Something happens and your judgment by which you weigh things goes down. You're now in the position of regenerating this by taking, say, one trip every three days, one trip every four days. And you pay for the vision of yourself by the loss of judgment. You pay for getting out by the loss of judgment. You pay for whatever visions you get by this loss in judgment. And a loss in judgment that stays and stays. Now, you might say, how do I know this? Have I ever taken it? Huh? No. And I haven't taken it for a rather simple reason. The price seems to be a little bit big, a little steep to pay. I'm giving the devil my judgment, my soul, my intellect, all of the things I've worked for, for this kick. Like an nymphomaniac, not like an erotic person, but like a nymphomaniac. Does anybody here envy the nymphomaniac? After all, there she is, having orgasm after orgasm, wonderful, all day long without a stop. <laughs> Beautiful, terrific. And anybody envy her? Does anybody envy? Why? Because you didn't envy that guy who was sitting in the state hospital either. The kick is cheap. The ecstasy is cheap. And you are settling for a second-rate, permanent second-rate world by the complete abrogation of the intellect. In the old days, if it wasn't done by lobotomy, it was done by psychoanalysis. Now it's done by drugs. I can find in myself no joy in such an outlook. Now, I share the basic concerns that uh, we've listened to tonight. I don't know whether LSD is a devil's toy. As a matter of fact, I spend uh, many hours a week, many, many hours in the last few years, thinking about, you know, it's very possible that LSD is uh, the worst thing that could ever come along. And uh, that uh, maybe the insidious thing is that as I take it, as I have over 400 times, uh, I've lost the discriminating ability. And maybe I may feel better and better as I'm lying in the gutter with my uh, uh, nose drooling, but I'm too brain damaged or too uh, um, uh, dazed to realize. So several years ago, uh, I began uh, myself and urging other people who are taking LSD to keep a checklist, an objective checklist as to where you are. Uh, not in uh, television game terms uh, about whether your grades are higher or lower and that sort of thing, but where you are basically in terms of your two billion year old uh, status on this planet. Now, each one of you would have a different checklist. Uh, mine had to do with how much time I'm spending out of doors as opposed to indoors, how much, how much percentage of time I'm spending with children as opposed to uh, game playing with adults. Am I making more money or less? I'm making less, and I think that's good, uh, and so forth. But I still don't know, and I'm still. I have an open mind on this question as to whether I am a spokesman for, uh, I wouldn't say the devil, but for a dangerous uh, uh, and diabolical situation. However, I just want to underline one difference that I see here, and it is a philosophic difference, it is uh, a uh, clear difference, and it's an ancient difference. Uh, We've heard a great deal of praise about the noetic function of the mind. Uh, do you want to keep your mind? Well, if you want to keep your mind and that judgmental function, stay away from LSD. Stay away from the religious experience. Because when you take LSD, you realize that what you call your mind is about 20 years old, or at best two or three hundred years old, and that the experience that I've been talking about is uh, much more ancient uh, and a much uh, uh, liberating experience. I want everyone to be warned. Don't take this trip unless you know you're playing around a blind roulette game with the most precious thing you have, your 30 billion cell nervous system. Read the labels. Read Dostoevsky. Read the New England Journal. Read our journals. 
read the ancient uh, stories of mystics and visionaries, and when you've read the whole thing, then forget the books and talk to people who had the experience, and then look yourself in the mirror and you decide yourself, uh, because the only control of LSD is self-control. The color films shown during Dr. Leary's presentation were excerpts from The Psychedelic Experience, produced by Gene Mayo and Alan Willis, music by Ravi Shankar, and Report from Millbrook, produced by Jonas Meckes. Mm -hmm.